What follows is free. But if you want to see the full extent of what we do and get involved, go to patreon.com slash word in your ear. Now, on with the show. Welcome to another edition of Word in Your Ear. Now, anyone remembering when the Human League split in 1980 and Martin Ware was brutally booted out might not have imagined that uh, at the time, that 42 years later, he'd be here with a memoir about the glittering career and the vast international success that followed as a musician and a producer. And we're so glad that he is the author of Electronically Yours, Volume 1, Martin Ware. Martin, lovely to see you. Thank you, and you too. I mean, I, I feel quite nostalgic, actually. i got to say, it's longer than 40 years. If, if, so the, you left the Human League in what year? 1980. 80. It's 42 80. years. So it's 42 years since yeah. we met in Paris. Good grief, that's extraordinary. Oh, good Lord. What so, happened? Yeah, what happened? So this is volume one. They, yeah. You're serious about volume one. This is There is going to be a volume two. Have you started on well, that? I figured that was an echo to the, the British yeah. found, uh, Electric there Foundations. Oh, the, uh, their research. Music of Quality and Distinction, volume one. Uh, well, I, is it really going to be two volumes? We don't know until this. You know, yeah. I mean, people, are, people like this one and it sells enough. But, you know, writing 130,000 words, as you know, you're both authors yourselves, yeah, yeah. is no joke, is it? I mean, it takes quite a lot of effort and time and revision. And, you know, that period of lockdown was just the right time to, uh, yeah. to kind of get everything, get all your ducks in a row. And uh, I've never written anything beyond about 3,000 words before, I think. Yeah. So um, it was quite an education. I enjoyed it, though, I think. It's physical hard labour. That's the truth about, about writing a lot You're hacking away book. at the coalface every day. You've got to keep doing it. Yeah. yeah, I don't know if it's physical hard, but it's definitely mentally hard labour. And um, I, I tell you what the hardest thing was, not writing the bloody thing, but doing the audio book. That oh, was right. insane. Have you ever done any of that? Yeah, I'm, yes. in the mid- I'm in the middle of doing one at the moment. Yeah. Jesus Christ. That's well, it's, a, it, it, it sometimes it makes you very, very self-conscious that you're reading out something you wrote to yourself and then regret writing it, and you just yes. feel really awkward. And I don't think... What I regret is not punctuating it properly, because yeah. I, was, I, I was determined to let people know that I, I, uh, that I was a proper writer. So I... I was a little bit probably too verbose and didn't pay enough attention to uh, where the breath should go. Yeah. Which you'd notice as soon as you're sitting in front of a microphone yeah. and you have to do it. You think, what clown wrote this long sentence? <laughs> <laughs> this clown. I, I know, I've, I've done it myself. Now, I've got to ask you one question. Is it true that the I think that mentioned in this book, the first record you bought was Pretties for You by Ellis Cooper? It's that, completely correct. I that is a pretty strange first record to buy. Well, do you know what? Um, it wasn't a conscious decision, really. Um, we used to, when I first started earning some money, uh, there weren't that many record shops in Sheffield. There was, there was an early Virgin store there, but um, there was the best bargains were to be had in boots at Christmas because they had <laughs> racks of uh, racks of records with no sleeves uh, where you know like kids being naughty just nick the sleeves thinking there was a record in it and there was nothing in it so they didn't have a replacement sleeve so there was a whole bunch of these things in the inner sleeves and I thought I like Phil told me that Frank Zappa's really good and it's on Frank Zappa's label and Alice Cooper, is that a woman? I honestly didn't know who it was. It was 50p, so I thought, well, I'll take the dip. <laughs> That's fantastic. Do you think there's, it's, there's lots about growing up in Sheffield that just made me think, is there anything about the character of Sheffield that that you can see in its, in its, in its music? You know, Joe Cocker and Dave Berry, and then later there was... Human League and ABC and the Thompson Twins and Pulp and the Arctic Monkeys. I yeah. don't know. Is it possible to say that there is yeah. a character there? I think there, I think it is possible, I and mean, I've done a lot of thinking about this. I get asked this question quite a lot, and um, I think that there's several factors in play here. One is there's a genuine love of soul music and blues uh, that goes back, obviously Joe Cocker, etc. I mean, you couldn't believe that guy wasn't black, let alone he was, he was singing in working men's clubs and pubs in Sheffield. Yeah. I mean, when he went to America, they thought it was totally authentic. So, uh, for instance, he got all that, and then he got the kind of heavy metal thing 
which is more of a kind of you know black country thing than Sheffield. But nevertheless, there was you know there was Sheffield and Doncaster and Iron Maiden and all that stuff. Um, but there's a general kind of um, bolshiness in, in, in included in the whole Socialist Republic of South Yorkshire thing, and it's like, <laughs> um, and also there's a kind of uh, pride in craft, which is uh, as evidenced by um, the kind of uh, you know cutlery business and steel working and, and yeah, uh, uh, and if you add all these things together, what you end up with is. Bands that, that do stuff without analysing it too much, and I think that has been. A, I think that's the continuous thread that runs through to the current day. Actually, so it's less about the kind of theorisation of, of you know, kind of London bands or uh, southern bands tend to. It's a. It's kind of a, like a theoretical exercise uh, almost, and it's like they go in and they rehearse endlessly and they come up with something. In in the in Sheffield, there's lots of places that are cheap to rehearse. That's another thing, because uh, there's a lot of derelict kind of places in the city centre. Not so much now, but it used to be in our time, and that meant that you could just mess about and do yeah. stuff, create something, be proud of it. It's like making a pen knife, you know. Move on, move on to the next thing, and that's what we used to do. And it's only with the benefit of hindsight, uh, looking back over 40 years that that I can now analyze, analyze it and kind of post-rationalize it, really. I was too busy doing it at the time. So like, a, lot of it, a lot of the people who are most important in your life, you met at school, is that right? Yeah, that's right. Well, take us through that. Okay, so, uh, well, not a lot, actually. I met Phil, who's the, you know, Phil Oakey uh, from the Human League, who's the most, was the most important person in my developmental years, you know, from kind of 17 to 21, I suppose. We were best buddies, and we literally used to hang out all the time. He got various motorbikes, and we used to go riding out into the countryside together. It was very romantic, and uh, <laughs> well, not literally. I'm, yeah, I'm teasing, but uh, but more to the point, his parent, his dad was head postmaster, and was never there for some reason, um, and I rarely got to see his mum either. So he had this. Quite big posh house, which oh, I was right. used to. Yes, you said uh, he was quite posh. That's right, very different. Yeah, uh, yeah. he wasn't particularly posh because he grew, he came from Solihull originally. Yeah, uh, but he, you know, shall we say aspirational middle class? Um, a great guy, obviously. I just wanted to be hanging out with him, and uh, uh, but he had this big house, so it's like being given a house to have house parties when he's seventeen. That is a tinderbox, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I speak quite a lot about it in font terms. You do. In the book. And I just look back now and go, thank you, Lord, because it was just like, you know, going to King Edward's school, it was like a, a posh grammar school. Um, and it was a state school, obviously, but he really, really wanted to be, you know, a public school. And they had, they, all the masters had gowns and they wore... A lot of the time they wore mortar boards and it's like they caned you for breathing, you know, and they were all perverts, really. <laughs> and, uh, the, 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 God, I'll get sued now. But that's, <laughs> no, I won't. It's Allegedly. Um, Allegedly. So, so um, but you, you started playing with music, playing around with music, and, and you only got Phil involved kind of later on, didn't you? Because you thought... He looks the part, kind of thing. Yeah, well, that, I, I, you said you never even knew if he could sing. No. You just kind of offered him the job. So, what was it about him that was so so impressive and charismatic? Well, before we come on to that, I need to mention that I went to this youth club called uh, Drama Youth Club called Meet Whistle, which is where I met Ian Marsh. Oh, Ian, yeah, Ian. Yeah. And actually, I met yeah. Glenn there as well. But that that's yeah. for a later part of the story. But um, yeah, when when we'd uh, we'd been down to various record companies with uh, our previous incarnation, the future. And we had uh, Addie Newton there, who, who went on to form Clock DVA, uh, who was doing a kind of sub Jim Morrison mumble <laughs> over the top of some soundscapes. And uh, and we love Addie. I still love Addie. We're still in contact. Uh, but he couldn't hold a tune, really. So uh, when we came back, we had to painfully um, release him. And uh, <laughs> and um, then we didn't we didn't really mix with musicians. You know, that's the thing. Because we we're not trained musicians, we didn't used to go to musician events. Uh, we were 
outsiders. Well, pop- it was kind of performance art, wasn't it? You talk about a group Kinda. called VD and the and, and, uh, and VDK the studs, and the studs and, yeah. And, and, and part of the act was just throwing out a bucket yeah. of pig's ears <laughs> that you threw yeah. at the students. I mean, <laughs> did you think of that? As just, I don't know, was that performance uh, that was, art or is that a theatre? Yeah, that, that, that was the drummer from, uh, that was Hayden Boyd's Western from uh, 2.3, who were one of the bands on Fast Product. This yeah. was before we were signed with uh, the Human League. Uh, and uh, but we were big mates with Cabaret Voltaire. They were really our inspiration and mentors. Having said that, never wanted to sound like them because you know, I mean, their gigs were kind of hard on the ears, to be honest. And we were more interested in songwriting and all that stuff. Uh, but we're nevertheless enormous mates, and so we used to have messing about groups and stuff. And then we got serious about it. Went down to London, presented our stuff to various record labels. Um, with our band called The Future, and it was just embarrassingly poor response, really, uh, except for Virgin and uh, Ireland showed some interest. So we, anyway, we came back to Sheffield, sacked Daddy, and uh, got Phil in, and uh, said, well, I, I think I know someone, he's got a really good haircut, and he looks good, and he dresses like a star. No idea if he could sing. So we got him in, played in the backing track for Being Bull, which we, in our naivety and stupidity, thought w- w- it was inspired by Parliament Funkadelic for us. And we thought it was kind of, even though it sounded a bit like sub craft work, it was meant to sound a bit funkier than that. And said, go away with this, you know, go away with this and, and write a top line and come in and we'll do, we'll do an audition. So he came in and he went, listen to the voice of Buddha saying, stop your sericulture. Go, whoa, whoa, hold on a second. What's sericulture mean? Yeah, what's sericulture? Yeah. And what? Uh, <laughs> Let uh, me stop you there. What are you talking about? Yeah. And, and, and Ian Marsh, to his eternal credit, turned around and said, you've got the gig. He didn't need to hear anymore. He said, you know, it was so, his voice was so unique and kind of baritone and and uh, he looked the part and we thought, you know, come on. But the irony is, as I mentioned in the book, that um, three three weeks before that, Glenn, who was my best mate, had moved down to London to seek his fame and fortune. Joined a band called Fifty Seven Men, which went on to be Wang Chung, oh, right. and um, and was was pursuing that path as a photographer as well during the day. And uh, but he would have been our first choice of singer had he not moved down three weeks earlier. So I'm really kind of fascinated looking back what the Human League might have sounded like or if it had been more successful, or if it developed in a different way, if we'd started with Glenn, as opposed to Phil. Who were the groups you thought of as, as rivals, then, at the time? Because oh, you're, all, you're all very influenced by Roxy Music, weren't you? All yeah, yeah, yeah. Faust. Who, who are the ones you thought, we? that's the challenge? Uh, we didn't Would really have... Depeche Mode? I don't know, your rhythmics? And no, 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 we didn't no. really have any rivals when we first started with the Human League. We thought we were... Um, Unique. Unique. To be honest. It didn't last long. I mean, but then of course, up on the rail, we kind of laid the the ground. The the ground. We were John the Evangelist for the uh, for the coming. You know, of Gary Newman, OMD, etc. Uh, and they went on to immediately have huge success. And we're going. Hold on a second. We released all this stuff. <laughs> Yeah, is that is that because you were? I mean, I, my memories of the early Human League were, were the kind of the enemy loved you, and you know you were you were kind of arty and left field and so forth. And then and then suddenly, what happened with electronic music in the early eighties was it was the chart, wasn't it? It was there was a yes. real switch, and and the Human League became a kind of beneficiary and a victim of that. Is that fair to say? I think so. I think the charts were always important, but the the. Uh... I think looking back on it now, the the acknowledged route to success was to for the record company to buy onto various tours, and you supported various popular acts. And we supported Susie and the Banshees on two national tours. We supported Peru, Stooges, the Stooges, uh, Iggy, and, not the Stooges, but Iggy, Iggy Pop. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, that's where I met Glenn Matlock actually. Uh, he was playing bass, and um, so it was clear that that. Um, Tactically speaking, that Virgin saw us as a kind of offshoot. We were trying to ride on the back of the punk credibility, and the po- and uh, I suppose what became new wave and 
post-punk. And I'm grateful they did because that gave us a lot more longevity than if they had just gone for the jug the pop jugular. We wouldn't have had that anyway. I mean, we you know we made it clear that we didn't want any interference in our creative process. That couldn't last forever, obviously. But you were intensely fashionable at that time. I can remember there's, I mean, and, and other people were taking advantage of that. There's a bit in the book where David Bowie comes to see you at the Nashville, I think it is, in 1979. Can you remember that? And and, and yes. would it be fair to say, I mean, he says, I think he said that you were the, the, the in the press, that you were going to be the future of music. I, know. I mean, is yeah. that kind of thing, would that, do you think that has been a bit of a risk? Um, no, just, we were just thought we'd arrived, to be honest. Yeah. I mean, if, 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 um, if God comes down and a beam of light comes down and he said, you are the anointed ones, you're not going to argue with it, are you? I mean, he was God to us, you know. He He's still the benchmark by which we measure our creativity, I think, to yeah. this day. And um, so, yeah, and actually I've got an even better story than that, which isn't in the book. Yeah. I only found this out six months ago. It's too late to go in the book. Um, we played a gig at the, uh, the um, Marquee Club in Water Street, which was sold out for ages. Okay, it's only like 350 capacity or something. And um, so it was oversold, basically, beyond five capacity. And uh, I only found out this six months ago. Somebody tried to get in uh, as a walk-up, and there was a, like a big queue. And um, two, of the pe- two other people who tried to get in at the same time were Iggy Pop and David Bowie. And the, <laughs> and the bouncers turned them away. Please, that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's and then two weeks later, uh, Bowie came to see to see us at um, uh, uh, the, I think it's the Nashville, yeah. Well, they, 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 the kind of break between Human League One and Human League Two is a core event in the book, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, yeah, uh, because core event in my life. Well, absolutely. Tell us about that because that felt like a betrayal, didn't and it? It still oh. feels raw, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, it's not. It's it, it's not literally something that's painful to me now but the memory of it is painful if you know what i mean so um yeah i mean basically i turned this is literally how it happened we'd behind the scenes to set the scene behind the scenes bob last our manager and the record company had been um having discussions shall we say not that we weren't i i certainly wasn't privy to um and that goes under the guise of the management protecting you from all the, you know, kind of machinations. So uh, they'd been obviously been saying, look, we need to find a way to make money out of this because we're in the hole for like a couple of hundred grand now with tour support and, you know, budgets, etc. And um, so credibility do not pay the bills, you know. Um, so obviously they come up with a plan to come up with this kind of justification that somehow creative differences, we couldn't get on together, blah, blah, blah. There was a certain amount of tension due to the fact that Adrian, who was basically a slide operator for the band, uh, suddenly one day Phil said, I want, I want Adrian to be an equal member of the band and have a quarter of all the songwriting and recording. And also uh, you saw his, the slideshow and you thought it was unintelligent. Oh no, it was unbelievable. I mean, it was literally, we'd never seen it. Bear in mind, it always went on behind us. Yes. <laughs> of course you never watched it. <laughs> oh, no, I've never did. thought of that. No, no, no. We saw the occasional photo. Of the, uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. We're not in the world of smartphones, right? No, no, no that's no. true. So we didn't know what was going on behind us. And it was like 1950s settees and uh, endless amounts of stills from Thunderbird films. <laughs> and and yeah. it, Which is kind of cute. But actually, Adrian used to have... A, a kind of bedsit flat, which was floor to ceiling with, it was absolutely archetypical nerd stuff with, you know, all the original models from Star Wars in in their original box. Yeah. Stacked up high, co- American comics everywhere. An amazing artwork, actually. But it was like, ba- it's showing the audience the interior of his mind. And it had nothing to do, or very little to do with the individual songs. Uh, so what did Bob last say then? And this must have been unbelievably painful because Phil's sitting there, your old pal you met when you were 14. What, they just said, you're out? Uh, I came into the studio. It, what was odd at first is that they were all there already. Ian, Phil and Bob <laughs> and Adrian. That's a very telling moment of the book. I thought, I thought that uh, that really feels real. That's it's so yeah. well described. I'm going, book. what's going on here? I mean, because we'd, we'd actually just arranged to meet for a rehearsal or a prep rehearsal for the European tour. The first words that were spoken is, Martin, we want you to leave the group. 
I, I was completely blindsided, as you would be. Bear in mind, not just the shock of that, but but Phil is my oldest and most loyal friend. I spent more time with him in the previous five years than I had with any other human being on Earth. You know, we might as well have been married. So it was like uh, uh, a visceral kind of reaction. I said, well, no, you're not. A bit like Jack Black in uh, School of Rock. Yeah. <laughs> the start, uh, you're not checking me out my own band. And then the thing that completely changed everything was that Ian Marsh decided to uh, come with me on the spur of the moment because he, he'd been privy to what's, what had been planned beforehand. So they'd already got a kind of, uh, shall we say, expectation management strategy. But also, the, the, I remember in the press, the story was that Phil had then subsequently gone off to the Crazy Daisy Disco and seen these yeah, girls. And, and this is exactly as you're saying, he, this is already in place, wasn't it? It's already, already in place. hired them. Already in place, as was Ian Burden from Graf, as was the main one is Joe Kelly. Joe, yeah. it, you know, it's a bit like uh, a football manager sacking all the team and then getting a new team in. Yeah. You know? yeah. Essentially, that didn't happen overnight. That was planned in advance. And... Um, so anyway, after thinking about it for twenty, I can't remember, twenty-four hours or whatever, I came back to uh, to Bob. I'm cutting a long story short here, and said, "Look, me and Ian will let you have the name in return for one percent on the next Human League album," which proved to be an absolute stroke of genius. Yes, yeah, absolutely. really, really. It could did. so easily have gone the other. Yeah. Way. It could have gone the other way. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so that paid for my first flight in London, and. Um, you know, it, uh, and also lots of silver and platinum discs. Uh, <laughs> it's really to me. To get, <laughs> one, one part of you, one part of you wants them to do really well for the yeah. money, and the other part of you would love them to fail. Yes, you know? <laughs> because then you're in the you 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 form Heaven Seventeen, yeah. uh, and you you're working with Ian uh, and, yeah. and Glenn yeah. on your own stuff in the same studio that Human League are working in. Is yeah. that right? So we had this really incredibly pitiful derelict building that we built a studio in and we ironically called it Monumental Studios and uh, it was literally a four-story high building that was completely derelict apart from one floor the first floor uh, the rest of it was looked like a bomb site so we went in uh, we did that one room up we got the electricity connected and blah 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 and and it was the only asset that we actually owned between us and we said well we're not giving the studio up you know this was part of the deal so we ended up saying, look, myself and Ian were computer operators used to working night shifts. We didn't mind doing that. So we'll take, uh, we'll have 12 hour, the 12 hour night shift and you have the 12 hour day shift. So Dare and Penthouse and Pavement and Music of Quality and Distinction Volume 1 were all being made simultaneously. At the, you know, we never bumped into each other. And at one point you found a tape. Yeah. what they've been doing. <laughs> Tell us about that. that it was, was extraordinary. So funny. So what a funny story. <laughs> it makes me laugh now. Uh, back in the day, before digital reverbs and, and delays and stuff, the way to get a, a, a kind of delay on the voice was either to buy a Watkins copycat or to set up a tape machine as a kind of delay unit. So uh, what that meant was when you're doing kind of effects on backing vocals or whatever, um, in this case, backing vocals, um, you would record onto the tape and then it would read off a different head. So the unintended consequence of that is that what had been sung into it stays on the tape. So anyway, we're getting ready to use it for the same purpose on one of our shifts. And we thought, we there was a, normally the tapes were all taken off and this tape was on there, so we'd better check where it is so we're not overwriting something and we'll get shouted at. And it, it it was there. It was it was uh, Phil instructing the girls how to sing "Sound of the Crowd." Oh my God! <laughs> I thought I really wish I'd have kept a copy of it. It was uh, it, it was uh, instructing. You found it encouraging. Oh my God! <laughs> But, but then again, you wanted. We thought we're going to win this game. Yeah, but you wanted one percent of whatever know, came out of it, didn't you? So. I didn't care. I, didn't care. <laughs> uh, I didn't think there was much chance of one percent no, right. into anything based on that. So, um, yeah, I mean, you know, it's a bit of a a, a, a kind of a strange love hate relationship at that point because. As I mentioned in the book, late, uh, a couple of weeks later, by way of apology, because we call them dodgy boilers in some... Um, <laughs> oh, 
They weren't dodgy boilers. It was it was the naughty, very naughty Paul Morley who claimed that the uh, 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 a session in a pub was off the record, and you and we were just laugh, you know, having a, you know, we were trying to make him laugh, and he quoted it, and next thing you know, it's like forty eight oh point, oh right? Uh, anyway, it's by way of apology, Glenn and Ian uh, rang up the girls. So you can see how kind of incestuous this whole thing. Is. Uh, rang up the girl and said, "Look, can we take you out to dinner to apologise?" And yes. I'm going. I'm going. Do you think this is really a good idea? I mean, seriously, isn't this is just going to inflame the situation? Anyway, they said yes, and it was all very nice and polite, and and um, yeah, oh, quite a funny story, I think. Right, but but then Heaven Seventeen had success. Yeah, I mean, did they happen straight away? No, not at all. Well, anybody who knows our career knows it was a series of uh, frustrating near misses for quite a while. Once again, I would say that whilst uh, the new Human League and Dare had broken through into the mainstream and they didn't really care whether they were trendy or not anymore, um, we were still in that cool but uh, not necessarily making a lot of money right. area of my career uh, of our career um very proud very proud of what we were doing creatively um but not really broken through to the mainstream acceptance so that didn't so the first album was a slow burner we didn't have any top 40 hits on it uh which was penthouse and payment but uh it was in the top 40 for 75 weeks i think which is quite an achievement. Wait, that's a long time. That's a long time. Come yeah, on. and, you know, a number of people have said to me, back in the day, people used to go to house parties and take album, you know, vinyl albums, and they used to write their names on the top yeah, right. Yeah, they did. Oh, they did. So, so people didn't nick them. And uh, we did, there was a documentary, um, which Kim Wilde, who's a good friend, kindly um, agreed to participate in. And as part of her kind of... Uh, tribute to Heaven, uh, to Heaven 17, she brought in her copy, which said Kim Fowler on it. Oh, you know? uh, right. Said, yeah, this is what she took to her party <laughs> when she was 16, right? And um, I thought that was funny. So we were kind of hip. But you had, I mean, Temptation when it came out, was in the number that was two later, record, wasn't it? That was yeah. later, Yeah, well, and that was, yeah, the Temptation, was that was a, a different thing entirely. So Let Me Go was the first single off yeah. the album. And that didn't get in the top 40, and we literally could not believe that, because I still think it's probably our best song. Anyway, so we had to beg Virgin to put to put Temptation out. They didn't want to put it out. And to cut a long story short, we were right, they were wrong. It, at one point, it was selling 20,000 copies a day, and they couldn't press enough copies. That would keep you number one for about five years now, I think. Um, <laughs> yeah, it would. <laughs> and... Um, and he missed out on number one by 1%, you know, which is a real pisser because Candy Girl got it instead. <laughs> New Not that you're still sore. So how, <laughs> did, how did that then, you then started to develop a kind of sideline, more than a sideline as a producer? Yeah, um, I mean, basically, the, the, the tactic of putting out Music of Quality and Distinction Volume 1 as British Electric Foundation and getting lots of guest singers in over kind of electronic, weird, soul kind of influenced backing tracks. Um, that was meant to be a calling card for outside productions. And we're not doing any outside productions at that point, but we knew that we wanted to devote our energies to being in the studio and, and, and creating work. So it was quite an abstract idea, but it paid off because we did a Ball of Confusion with Tina Turner on the f on that album, and then uh, as luck would, well, it's not luck, is it? Because it's kind of like you, you're putting the energy out there and it comes back in a different way. But yeah, um, you know, uh, Roger Davis, when he was putting together the um, uh, Private Dancer album, wanted to have, I mean, he got uh, 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 what they call him, um, Terry Britton and Graham Lyle, yeah, yeah, writing that you know, those amazing songs, you know, What's Love Got to Do with and blah blah blah, uh, which were quite trad pop rock and I think he saw that he wanted something with an edge to give the whole thing a bit of a modern sheen you know yeah. and uh, so they came to us and said would, would Hem 17 write a couple of songs for that album and we said no we can't 
Because we we just don't feel that we're confident in writing for right. for, right. for for like a legend, a, le- a literal legend. But why don't we do you a couple of um, you know? We'll put our heart and soul into doing a couple of cover versions, of which my top choice was um, "Let's Stay Together." Unfortunately, Tina agreed. You know. Right. You write quite a bit about Tina Turner that she was just an incredibly impressive individual and uh, you know beyond professional. They are really hard nosed about every choice. Is that fair to say? You know, um, I think she'd been under under the control of Ike for so long. She was just in this place in her mind where she wasn't going to take. She was mad as hell and not going to take it anymore. And so everything, she built a new structure in her life where she was going to make the decisions. She needed advice, of course, you know, and she didn't know everything and she acknowledged that. And in fact, you know, she had nothing whatsoever to do with the construction of the music. Uh, She literally came in, did her exemplary uh, inspirational performance and then went, you know, Mm -hmm. that's what she, she was, she's a performer. You know, she was never involved in the songwriting or arrangement or anything. And that was the way things were. That's what she understood. And um, so when she... But the impressive thing about it, and I teach um, songwriting now at MA level, and I'm always saying to my students, you know, this is the gold standard, platinum standard, whatever. Learn the song. Learn how to uh, act it literally to the to the imagine there's one person listening to it in a room right in front of you maybe even just speak the lyric at them as as you as though you would be acting it to them and then you can add the color to her and the melody and all that stuff and she did that she was that was such an intimate performance it's so impressive when you hear that on the radio it just grabs you from the outset and that was 25 years of experience, you yeah. know. Yeah. So you, you, you went on to produce loads of people. What would you say? I mean, producers come in all shapes, all sizes, and, and you know, they have different skill sets. What's your skill set as a producer? I've got a very good ear, I uh, think, for arrangement. I don't read or write music, so I can't claim it's a technical gift, apart from I can program, obviously, uh, uh, on digital audio workstations. But... Um, I understand timbre and arrangement uh, because I developed my craft through learning electronics, you know. So I had to, when you're designing sounds from scratch, you have to learn how to fit them together. And then you you apply that knowledge to acoustic instruments or, you know, banks of instruments like string sections or whatever. And I think the because my first skill was learning about the abstraction of timbre through electronics that gave me a different aspect on it the other thing is that i um i'm quite good at psychologically getting the best performances out of singers we're going to ask you about terence trent darby i mean it's because that's an extraordinary thing you know you were talking about you were suddenly on the producer hot list as it were after uh after Tina Turner, in fact, you turned down Bette Midler, I think, yeah. which I think you regretted. But yeah. then you finish up uh, producing Terence Trent Dubby, and that was, we forget, that was an enormous thing at the time. And it, did you reckon, I mean, how did you get that job in the first place? And, and how, what did you, did you recognise his extraordinary charisma and, and talent immediately? Well, here's the story. This was is, he hard to handle? <laughs> and, well, all those questions, but, and, and, well, the last one is no, but uh, I'll come back to that. But the, so I, I'm sat in my flat in Notting Hill one day, and I've already agreed. I mean, I've got a continuous stream of productions coming up and booking three months ahead and blah, blah, blah. And I kind of provisionally agreed to do a new production. I think it was Wet, Wet, Wet or something. And I thought, it's quite good. I think we can make something good out of it, but I wasn't that bothered, really. And then a cassette turns up on a bike, un- uh, unannounced, at my front door. And it's this guy, handwritten letter from a guy called... Uh, a young lad called Lincoln Elias, who was 17 and just become the kind of mentee of uh, Muff Wimwood at S- uh, Capital, Sony, I think it was Sony. And, um, and it's this handwritten letter saying, you've got to listen to this. You just have to listen to it. So I listened to it and I was, I, I was amazed. I mean, it sounded like an authentic uh, 
soul singer from like the 60s, 70s. Um, and I said, well, well, you know, I rang him up immediately and I said, how old is he? He said, oh, he's like 23 or something. I was going, and the, and the songs, and he wrote, I said, and he wrote all these songs? Because a lot of them sounded like, out, sounded like outtakes from an, an unknown <coughs> Stevie Wonder album. And it says something um, that when we actually went on to do the album, that he'd already got rid of all those songs. The, 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 he didn't even record any of those. He was so prolific. But anyway, went to meet him the following day, and the first thing I said to him was, um, I know the album that you want to make. I can protect you from the record company <coughs> uh, so that we can create a sense of a sense of uh, camera, you know, camaraderie, and you know, a bit like he wants to do with football teams. You know, it's us against the world, and just me, Phil Leg, the engineer, who we knew already, and uh, and and Terence. I'm not allowed to call him Terence now, by the way. Uh, he'll get angry with me. So Sananda. Sananda. Yeah. So Sananda, um, and um, apparently that was the phrase that um, they did that it convinced him. And we went on, of course, Wishing Well was number one in America. It sold 10 million. And then the copies. follow up, he suddenly announced that you must have think, been thinking this because you talk about being on a percentage of. I've got, to, I've got to ask one question before that. You, I think you say you, when it was such a big success, you started getting really big checks. Yeah. You'd never had big checks like that before. I mean, you'd had big checks, but never quite that big. Is that fair never to Never had say? that. No, no, no. We're talking a different... Yeah, you said you band. were on 3% of retail for nine yeah. of the 11 tracks, if I remember yeah, rightly. that's, that's correct. Incre- that must have been huge. It was the number uh, one record it, all it, the world. Was, I remember my, my uh, lawyer, rank, uh, Brian Carr, who everyone knows, um, uh, he rang me up one day. I was at the Groucho Club, actually. He, said, he, he had a really posh voice, and he said, Oh, Martin. I think you're going to be rather pleased because the checks used to go to my lawyer. Um, no electronic transfer in those days. Uh, I think you're going to be rather pleased with this check. I <laughs> and I just had a drink and I was watching some footy on the telly and I'm going, oh, we'll talk about it tomorrow. Brian said, no, I think I should tell you how much it is now. It was £324,000. And I went, it was a bit like um, somebody turning up at the postcode lottery going, you just won a million, you know, to me. And went this was in what, 18, 18, this, this is 87, when? 87, 88? Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah and, Incredible. Um, so I'm going, wow, okay, that, that's, that's a different order. Yeah. Um, and of course, that was just the start of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, imagine how much money Terence earned. I mean, I've tried to do a calculation. I reckon it's in the region of 20 million just from that album. Really? Yeah. Because uh, he wrote all the tracks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well. Yeah, yeah. And owned all the uh, and owned all the uh, mechanical rights. Right. So, but then uh, insisted that he did it all himself on the on the follow-up. Oh, I mean, right. how did you feel? You've given the game just... away now. It's my best story. <laughs> They're gone. So, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, it, again, uh, this handwritten letter thing is becoming a bit of a thing. So... He's a very verbose character, uh, Terence. Um, he's a bit like when you receive a missive from him. It's a bit like Samuel Pepys, Sananda, sorry, and um, and it was literally like a dear John letter from Vietnam, going, "I love you, but I'm not coming home," you know. And he saw it basically. He said, "I want to do it all myself." And when he says all himself, he'd already written, uh, uh, written and performed all his own tracks on the first album, but he wanted to do that. Plus engineering, plus producing, plus everything, because he saw himself in direct competition with uh, Michael Jackson and Prince. Mm. They would he saw those as his competition, and the fact that Prince played everything on his first album was kind of riling him, I think. Mm. And he wanted to, and anyway, so cut, again, cut a long story short. Um, I was in the middle of producing. Erasure's I Say, I Say, I Say album. And I went out to Wimble Lane in Dublin. And Terence had just been there um, mixing his second album, Neither Fish Nor Flesh. And the tape op said to us that he'd um, mixed the album on acid. And uh, didn't think that was a particularly good album. <laughs> I think that pretty much sums it up, didn't it? And the record was called Neither Fish Nor Flesh. Yeah, yeah it, sold, is... it sold 300,000 as opposed to 
seven million. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, I mean, there's all sorts of adventures in production in this book, which I, is one of the things I love about it. <laughs> you produced some of the most unlikely people. You produced hot gossip. <laughs> that was my first production, outside <laughs> production. Yeah, I mean, based uh, largely on the fact that I thought they were excitingly hot, right. um, and um, but. Um, it was actually Carol Wilson uh, who ran Din Disc, which is an offshoot of Virgin, who came to, came to me and said, "Would you fancy doing it?" And I said, "Well," and they, but the thing that swung it was they wanted to record new versions of uh, some um, Heaven Seventeen and Early Human League songs, and I thought, "Well, that's quite an interesting challenge." <coughs> so that appealed to me. But what I didn't really check in advance is whether they could actually sing or not. Um, and they could hold a tune, but it's very kind of, you know, that kind of like that West End stage kind of trained. Find yes. your twang, find your twang, you know, sing you down your nose, and oh, I can't. It's not really my cup of tea that. But um, uh, anyway, we we made something out of it because there was a couple of them that, were, that had really good voices. Right, right. But you did all kinds of things like, but you started getting calls to do things. And you got, uh, I was intrigued by Dan Hartman. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Tell yeah. us about Dan Hartman. Dan, I love, oh, Americans, they're great, aren't they? Um, <laughs> Dan, uh, I mean, I love Dan's work, number one. Uh, and I, I, I'm a big disco fan, always have been. And, you know, he'd just done Living in America with James Brown and, and I just could not, he just had a number one in America with that. And, I'm, and then I got this call and I'm going, why would Dan <laughs> Hartman want me to produce him? He's a producer and a very good one. I just couldn't wrap my head around it. And he said, because I want, uh, I want the um, authentic English urban sound, you know, and it's like, what what is, what is that, that? <laughs> yeah, yeah i'm just doing what i do you know so, so um anyway he turned up and then we I said yeah fine he's he paying me well and <clears throat> you know he's also a fantastic keyboard player by the way you know mm, mm. and um so i thought i'm a terrible keyboard player and what's he gonna think so he turned up at swan yard studios in islington jet lagged and turned up in the studio and i, I, I i'm there and the studio is empty because i'll thought, i wait till he arrives and we'll figure out which synths we're going to hire and all that he said where's the rig you know and i'm going we haven't hired anything yet where are all the musicians i want to start now and it's like oh, okay uh do you mind if we start in the morning you know and it's like okay so we did that we didn't get off on the right foot but anyway we, we hired some stuff in everything starts and um that, there's that funny story in the book where he was boasting about how much you like hot food. <clears throat> I, I mean, I presume you guys have been to Los Angeles. Yes. I don't know if you've ever been to an Indian restaurant there. They don't know the meaning of hot food. <laughs> I, they, I suppose they do with Mexican food, but not with Indian food. So we said, okay. So yes. we, we thought we'll get our own back. For this was good. Yeah. And, um, and uh, we got them to bury some extremely hot lime pickle in the middle of a fall. And... Uh, and uh, he was so proud he wouldn't let on. There was steam coming off him. <laughs> it was brilliant. Anyway, we missed it later. It was a bit like a candy camera show. And we got on fine from that moment, you know. Right. So this book, I mean, have you you sent this to many of the people featured in the book? And Yeah. What, what are their responses? Reaction? I mean, people like Phil. I mean, what's your relationship with Phil like now? Well, this is very interesting. I... Actually, I haven't sent any. Oh, I need to send him one, but uh, he's he's kind of gone off radar a bit. But interestingly, we bumped into his manager, who we've had a variable relationship with over the years. But um, and he was incredibly polite and nice to us, and and you know, mooting potentially doing some more work. With, you know, I'm going. Well, Phil himself said, didn't he, a while ago, that he wouldn't be against the idea of recording. Yeah, but with then him. he's got. Then I've chased him, and he's he's not even responded. So I don't know what's going on. Yeah. But anyway, um, I uh, I don't know what Phil's reaction is. I don't know if he's read it. Uh, actually, you've reminded me. I must send him a copy. But I just don't want to kick the hornet's nest, probably. <laughs> so would you? I mean, because obviously the, 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 the original Human League as a, as a touring entity could happen. Well, we did um, uh, we did a, a sh uh, two shows, one in Sheffield at City Hall and one at the Roundhouse where we wanted to put on the first two Human League albums. 
with Phil. We asked him if he would do it for about eight or nine years, and he just wouldn't wouldn't accede to it at all until eventually his management went online and said, "Over my dead body." So I said, "Well, that's pretty final." Um, so we just said, "Well, we'll just do it, and and Glenn will do Phil's part because he's got a similar range of." And we did all we did new versions of the of the visuals in super duper digital giant screens with Malcolm Garrett doing his version of it, uh, who's our you know kind of yeah. old guy, and um, yeah, so we did that and it was very well received. It was it was the first amongst the first gigs after lockdown, and uh, we'd love to do some more of that, and we'd love Phil to do it if he was interested. You know. Do you ever look back at school pictures? You must have school pictures of class lineups where you and Phil Oakey are in the same class. Or you know, I don't possess one. Oh, I didn't really? really enjoy my time at King Edwards. I have to say, it was. A... No, I'm just intrigued by the idea that relationships that start when you're 16 are yeah. still a fact of your life, all those years later. Yeah, well, I think they're the formative years, aren't they? I I really believe that. I I, I mean, you know, Glenn and Ian. Obviously, I met when I was like 18. Um, and I, you know, and Ian Reddington, the actor, still one of my best friends. Paul Bauer is like my personal archivist. He was the one who introduced Bean Boyle to Bob Last. You know, they're all people I still I'm in touch with on a weekly basis. You know, right. and uh, I don't know if you have you guys have anything like that, but I'm I feel privileged. You know, no, no, it's good. So there's the book, electronically yours, volume one. But as you said. Depending on how well it does, volume be, two may still be volume two. <laughs> it better do pretty damn well for me to devote six months to write in volume two. It's very good. It's the demand will be so great, you'll have to do it, man. Yeah. Oh, thank you. No, yeah. I think it is, I'm very proud of it. I think it's quite entertaining. I do think the uh, it's worth if you can listening to the audiobook as well because there is some of the funny stories kind of come to life even more when I'm reading them out I have to say okay I got stopped I have to tell you one last thing I got stopped from singing various uh, bits oh of... they haven't cleared the rights no they haven't cleared the rights so <laughs> yeah. I have to yeah. speak them in some yeah, kind absolutely. of Rodney and esque <laughs> <laughs> it's terrible <laughs> well even one quite... of the teenagers are... <laughs> even quoting from lyrics in, in audio you can only allow a very short very amount difficult of business. That's right. yeah. very difficult business yeah. well, look, very nice, good. To, nice to talk to you lovely to talk to you I think we...